Next, we'll hear from Mr. Aguilar, then Mr. Adderholt, and then Mr. Chris. Mr. Aguilar, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary and General. Secretary Austin, recently you spoke about the need to track and understand and respond to malign activities in the gray zone, including the information space and the need to invest in irregular warfare capabilities. What is the Ukrainian crisis teaching the nation about the importance of irregular warfare in a peer and near peer fight? Again, I, I think it's, uh, this is a thing that we need to be uh, capable of addressing going forward uh, and that we account for that in our strategy. Um, we've seen uh, the Russians engage in this type of activity uh, in a consistent fashion uh, throughout since, since 2014. We've watched this uh, continue to unfold. So we'll need to make sure that we have the right capabilities and the, and the people with the right skills uh, to be relevant in, uh, in this, this kind of activity going forward. How are we thinking about future policies, existing policies, um, that will enable us to, to compete effectively in this climate moving forward? And the policies, our policies, we, we need to make sure that they, they su support uh, uh, speed of effort and that, that we, are, um, we have the authorities necessary to, uh, to get after the things that, that again, will be effective uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this fight. Uh, and I think, as with anything, uh, these, our policies and authorities will, will evolve. Uh, as we, you know, as we continue our efforts in this and other places uh, around the globe. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, I wanted to shift topics and talk about domestic violent extremism and express my support for your continued commitment to address uh, threats of domestic violent extremism in the military. You previously spoke with us and said that 99.9% .9 of troops uh, serve with dignity and honor. Um, but a small number can have an outsized impact on a great organization. Uh, and you've talked about including reworking exist existing screening procedures uh, for recruits, partnering with other federal agencies, and revamping insider training programs. And General Milley, you've spoken about these as, as well, these programs. Uh, Secretary, can you talk about how the fiscal year 23 budget request continues support for these efforts? It it, uh, it certainly does allow us to continue to uh, support the, the policies and procedures that we put into place, uh, and and uh, again I would echo what you said earlier. My firm belief has been and remains that 99.9 percent .9 of our troops are, are focused on the right things and are doing the right things e each and every day. We we certainly, as you pointed out, need to do a good job, a better job of uh, screening people as they come into the military. And also, as, uh, as they're in the military, making sure that they remain focused on uh, supporting uh, those values that they've sworn an oath to, uh, to uphold. So, so but, but we have, uh, in this budget, we've asked for uh, the, an ample amount of funds to, uh, uh, to, to support our efforts uh, in, that, that you uh, asked about. General, uh, domestic violent extremism, and uh, you've spoken with this committee about this in the past, and, and appreciate your comments. What more? What more can we do? Um, how should we be thinking through um, uh, future insider threats and, and some of the um, you know policies that uh, that might need to be addressed and changed? Um, just a couple of things. First of all, I think the size, scale, and scope of the problem is very, very small inside the military. Um, um, and as the secretary just said, 99.9 percent .9 of those in uniform are serving their country faithfully and their uh, faithful adherence to their oath to the Constitution of the United States. Uh, having said that, <clears throat> small numbers can make a big difference um, if they choose to use violence in some manner, shape, or form. So it all comes down to good order and discipline of the force, uh, and that is the role of the chain of command. So the best thing we can do um, is to reinforce uh, the authorities of the chain of command educate the chain of command to signs and indicators of radical extremism on one bent or another, uh, and then to take appropriate action uh, if they identify someone who uh, displays those sorts of behaviors. We're into behavior, not thought. Uh, that's a, a very, very important distinction. Uh, we're not out to govern people's thoughts, uh, but behavior is a different matter. And that's what, <clears throat> that's what the Uniform Code of Military Justice is all about, and that's uh, one of the key roles of a chain of command. 
appreciate the leadership that both of you have shown in this uh, regard, and thank you for continuing to work with uh, this committee and, and others uh, to address these issues um, moving forward. And like you both said, uh, an incredibly small number, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, they were doing everything we can uh, to protect the workforce, protect the country, uh, and ensure the proper leadership. So thank you both so much. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Adderholt, please. Thank you. Um, Secretary Austin, uh, General Milley, uh, Under Secretary McCord, thank you all three for being here today. Uh, my uh, first question deals with uh, uh, some uh, uh, mineral issues that we've uh, potentially could have, problems we could have in this country. Of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated uh, how Europe has been affected by reliance on Russia for resources like oil and gas. But a recent U.S. Geological Survey report illustrated that the United States has similarly relied on Russia and China for some of our most critical mineral needs. And um, I, too, uh, have concerns about the defense industrial base being too reliant on countries that uh, probably doesn't have our best interest at heart. Uh, and I, I think certainly we all should agree that the time to address this and look at this now is as opposed to waiting until a crisis occurs. Uh, I plan to work with my colleagues to try to address this problem. Uh, my question to you, uh, let me just address this to you, uh, uh, Secretary Austin. Uh, how concerned are you about the risk posed uh, to the defense industrial base by continued reliance on strategic uh, adversaries for our critical minerals? And uh, what else can uh, we do to try to, to address this issue? Uh, I, you raise a very, a very good point, sir. I, it, this is a, an issue that's very important to us. It's also important to our country. Uh, it's important to our president. As you've seen, the president uh, um, adopt uh, an initiative that causes us all to focus more on our supply chain vulnerability. DOD certainly has a key part of that. Uh, we're concerned about uh, making sure that we have the right capabilities with respect to uh, microelectronics, um, casting and forging, uh, battery and, ener and energy storage, uh, critical materials, as, as you pointed out. I uh, want to make sure that we have the right uh, amounts of stockpiles to, uh, to be able to support our efforts. So DOD is focused on this as a part of uh, uh, the overall uh, government's effort. But uh, to your point, this is very, very important to us. So this is something that you do have some great concerns about it, at this point? It is. Yeah. It is. Uh, General Milley, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I, I concur 100 percent. A concern about uh, us being overly reliant uh, on raw materials, critical minerals, as you say, uh, from any country that's an adversary to the United States. Uh, uh, to the extent that's humanly possible, that stuff should be uh, produced in the United States and under our control. Let me uh, just uh, also uh, uh, mention uh, something that's already been asked about, but uh, we've already talked about how we have done so much to send vital equipment to uh, Ukraine. And, uh, you know, of course, we can always debate whether we've sent enough and, and that, but uh, there's no doubt that the success they've had has been because of our helping in the process. But uh, to follow up on a question that uh, uh, Ranking Member Granger uh, much of the equipment that has come out of our own uh, defense uh, stockpiles. And uh, I'm glad that Congress has already appropriated $3.5 billion to DOD to, to backfill the transfer of transferred equipment. And, of course, last night the House passed uh, legislation uh, for um, additional support for Ukraine. Uh, it is clear that DOT's equipment stocks uh, could prove uh, vital if a similar situation will arise in the Pacific and Taiwan. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on whether the Department of Defense level of stockpiled equipment and munitions should be grown to the levels larger than they were prior to Russia's invasion. Uh, thanks, sir. Uh, and again, thanks for your support on, in getting the uh, legislation through yesterday. That's, uh, that's, that's very helpful to us. Um, as you know, we, we base our decisions on the size of the stockpile on our requirements. And, uh, you know, as we look around at our global requirements to, to support our plans, uh, we, we believe that uh, the stockpiles are, are adequate. And uh, if we believe that we need to grow them based upon changing situations or changes in our plans, then certainly 
uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll do that. We'll take that on and and make sure that uh, that we advise the president that, that that's a necessity. But right now, again, our requirements uh, put us in a place where uh, we have the stockages that we have, and uh, and we think it's it's about right. So, so do you, do you think if we increase our stockpiles, it would deter aggression by China toward Taiwan? Um, you know, our adversaries don't really know what we have in our stockpiles, uh, nor should they. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm not sure that that would act as a, uh, in, in, in itself as a deterrent. Uh, they'll judge, uh, uh, I mean, they'll, they'll base their judgment on, uh, on our actions uh, and our, our demonstrated commitment uh, more so than, uh, than what they believe our stockpiles to be. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Adholt. Mr. Mr. Christ? then Mr. Carter, and then Ms. Kilpatrick. Mr. Chris, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to express my gratitude to, uh, to you, Mr. Secretary, and general to you as well. Um, as uh, Member Ruppersberger mentioned in his uh, beginning comments, the service you've provided to our country has been extraordinary. And um, God bless you for your dedication to uh, protecting America and freedom. Um, so I was curious. I read about the uh, hypersonics that were used against Odessa. Um, obviously, that's very disconcerting. And I wondered if you had any commentary if we should expect more of that or what your, what your view of it is. Either one of you. Please. <laughs> um, I would, a couple of comments. Uh, one is the Russians have used uh, uh, several hypersonic missiles. Uh, the, obviously, the distinguishing factor of a hypersonic missile is the speed at which it travels. Uh, and we have uh, analyzed uh, each of these shots that they've taken. Uh, and I'd like to go into a classified session and discuss any of the specific details. Uh, but other than the speed of the weapon, in terms of its effect on a given target, uh, we are not seeing really significant or game-changing effects to date with the delivery of the uh, small number of hypersonics that the Russians have used. But I can elaborate further in a classified session if you'd like. Sure. I appreciate that. Mr. Secretary, you have any comment on that? No, I absolutely agree with the chairman. Uh, and they've used a number of them. Ukrainians are still fighting. And uh, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that. Very well. Um, is this the first time that we know that they have decided to utilize hypersonics in this war? This it, to my knowledge, the first time of the use of hypersonic munitions in a combat situation. Ever. As far as I know, yeah. Yes, sir. Hypersonic weapon. Right? Yes, sir. No, I understand. But, but the Russians have used them several times in this conflict. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, to not a major game changer to this point. So. Great. Uh, I know you don't have a crystal ball, and it's hard to read Putin's mind, I'm sure. But given the fact that he's utilizing these weapons now, these missiles, do you think that exacerbates the potential for nuclear or not? Or can you tell? Uh, it, it's very difficult to predict, you know, what uh, or to, to say what Mr. Putin is thinking. But I, I don't, uh, I would not say that because he's used a hypersonic weapon that that's going to, uh, cause him to be willing to elevate to, uh, to use a nuclear weapon. Um, you know, again, he's he used uh, hypersonic weapons weeks ago, and, uh, and I think he's trying to create a specific effect with the use of that weapon. And as the chairman has pointed out, uh, it moves at a speed that makes it very difficult to interdict, uh, but it hasn't been a game changer. Pardon me. Uh, he has you options. You know, he, he can, you know, I mean, he, he can launch... Uh, a cyber attack, he can employ chemical weapons, uh, those kinds of things that we're all on the lookout for uh, to see if, you know, he makes those kinds of decisions. But I don't think that, that this necessarily takes him to uh, the, the use of a, of a nuclear weapon. So. so we voted last night, the House, for $40 billion to help Ukraine. Uh, hopefully the Senate will do that soon. Are we doing enough to keep Ukraine free and protect our ally as much as we should be? Uh, we're doing a lot. Um, and, you know, uh, our allies are doing a lot. 
and we're going to continue to do everything that we can for as long as we can uh, to help them defend their their uh, their sovereign space. And and, uh, and so um, I think the Ukrainians are very grateful for what we're doing for them. It it, you know, it has made a significant difference in their ability to uh, to blunt the the uh, the advance of uh, of a of superior Russian force. Uh, and and so again. Uh, the, their needs will change as this as this war evolves. Uh, at the beginning of the fight, uh, sir, you remember we were uh, focused a lot on providing anti-armor and, and anti-aircraft weaponry. Uh, that uh, really put them in a in a good place. It helped to uh, uh, help them win the Battle of Kiev in the north. Uh, but as the fight has shifted to the south and to the east, uh, we now see uh, that they have more of a need for long-range artillery. Uh, tanks and armored vehicles and those sorts of things. And in working with our allies, uh, we're talking uh, talking to the Ukrainians routinely, and we're trying to provide them exactly what they think they need in the fight. Great. Well, thank you both again uh, very much for what you're doing and protecting this uh, democracy and this great ally of the U.S. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome. Mr. Carter, then Ms. Kilpatrick, and then Mr. diaz Ballard, you'll be joining us by video. Mr. Carter. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for being here. I want to tell you about a conversation I had with a group of people in my district last week. Uh, you know, we're all, I've got Fort Hood in my district. You all know that. I'm very, very proud of men and women that serve in uniform. And I commend you for trying to give them the very best. But we also, as we take care of our war fighters, have to remember the burdens, the things in the real world have on the, that is the economy, has on the, uh, the families of these, of these war fighters. And right now, what's going on in our part of Texas is our mobile population in America. Americans are migrating to Texas in gigantic numbers, carrying large amounts of money from real estate sales they made in other states that they left. And so not only are they driving up the cost of housing ridiculously high, a house worth $350,000, real worth, is selling for a million, and so forth. Therefore, even the smaller homes that might be available for servicemen and women off post be driven, being driven up to seven hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars. And then when they with the benefit of a VA loan, they can compete in that market. The buyers, I mean the sellers don't want VA loans because the other guys are offering cash. That drives our all of our military families into the rental market. The rental market is growing at the same rate. So something that six months ago was $250 a month, uh, $2,000 a month, is now $4,500 a month. And something that was like $1,000 a month is now $2,500 a month. Now I realize you're giving them a raise, and I'm really happy about that. Have you considered increasing BH, BAH levels to meet this type of inflationary challenge that we're seeing around our post, not just in Texas, in many other parts of the country? I'd like to hear your comments, Mr. Secretary, and also General Milley. Uh, uh, thanks, sir, and thanks for your tremendous support of our troops and families that uh, in in the Fort Hood area, uh, that's a pretty important part of the, our overall uh, structure in the military here, uh, big installation. This is a very important issue to me, you know, that the health and well-being of our family, family members and our troops. Um, you saw us take some action uh, last year or this year uh, to increase uh, BAH in certain areas that were uh, challenged by the, the forces that you just mentioned. Uh, what we're asking for in this budget is help to do more of the same going forward. I think this is really, really important. Uh, you know, 
that the strain caused by uh, rising rent uh, cost and uh, and you know a number of other things are really kind of creating some adverse effects for our, our lower ranking enlisted, and we, we remain cited on this. Uh, so so we're asking for that so some help with that in this budget. We're also asking for two billion dollars to support uh, uh, the construction of. Uh, family housing, military family housing, and the improvement of military family housing uh, as well. So uh, thanks for your support thus far, and I, I believe this is really, really important, and so we're asking for more help uh, to, so we can do more of the same in the future. And I, I would echo everything the Secretary said, Congressman. I've known you for a long time and uh, have many fond memories of Fort Hood myself, and I heard Congressman Calvert say most of those people are coming from California, so um, I question uh, whether or not uh, Texas made the right choice there. But having said that, <laughs> that was meant to be funny. Um, look, at it, uh, soldiers, soldiers don't ask for much. Uh, uh, they, they want good housing, good health care, good education, and a safe environment for their family. And, and, and I believe that uh, I know that the Secretary of Defense has the entire department focused on it. Uh, and, and I will personally take a hard look at the BAH numbers. Uh, to see if uh, it, it's appropriate to make further recommendations on any further increases uh, in terms of uh, housing allowances specific to the Fort Hood area or other areas that are uh, experiencing that. The, the gentleman, you, you'll, you'll enjoy my constituents. They're fine people. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. I have another question, but I know I've run out of time. We'll make sure it gets submitted for the record. Um, thank you. And uh, as you know, there's a freeway that connects Texas and Minnesota. And we have better fishing. Um, so, <laughs> Ms. Kilpatrick, we're going to go to you. Mr. diaz Ballard. if you wouldn't mind getting ready to turn on your video. Thank you, Ms. Kilpatrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my first question has to do with climate change. Mr. Secretary, uh, I'm pleased to see the concerted effort in the budget addressing climate change, the Department of Defense has recognized for a while that a changing climate will have significant economic impacts across the globe, lead to food insecurity issues and potential shifts in regional balances. The Department of Defense is proposing to invest 3.1 billion in this budget for increased generators storage and resiliency at military installations, which is a top priority for Fort Huachuca and Davis Monthan Air Force Base in my district. This funding would also go toward improved energy efficiency and logistics and research in reducing energy demand, improved storage and other energy supplies. Secretary Austin, what are your goals as you direct the department's efforts to meet the climate challenge? Well, thank you. And I think you nailed it right away when you mentioned that this does affect not only our, our installations, as we look at our installations and the, in the coastal regions uh, with the effects of rising uh, water levels, uh, the effects of severe weather, as we have had to deploy troops uh, with a greater frequency to address the aftermath of uh, severe storms. Uh, we're deploying troops to fight fires. Uh, but to your, the point that you made earlier, in the, in the, the regions that we operate in, uh, we're seeing uh, climate change uh, uh, cause migration uh, in some cases and competition, increased competition for water. So DOD is the, uh, is the largest uh, consumer of energy in the, in, in the government. Uh, you know, our goal is to make sure that we reduce our carbon footprint by uh, reverting to you know, on our installations using more electric vehicles. Uh, I've challenged uh, our installation commanders to find ways to be more efficient in their energy usage. Uh, and so we have a number of ongoing uh, projects and efforts uh, to reduce that carbon footprint and be more good, uh, be better stewards of, uh, of you know, our resources here. But I, again, to the point that you've made, we're asking for uh, $3.1 billion in this budget uh, to help with our efforts uh, in addressing uh, installation resiliency 
and energy storage. Thank you. Uh, my second question is for General Milley. Uh, it has to do with military medical reforms. The military health system is undergoing its most significant transfer transformation in decades. Medical reforms have included a transition of military treatment facilities from control of the services to the Department of Health agencies and reducing military medical manpower in support of the services lethality, lethality prior, priorities. General Milley, are you concerned about the direction of mili military medical manpower? Are efforts being coordinated across the military services and with the joint staff? And what are the concerns with the medical manpower reductions the services are anticipating? The, um, th thanks for the question. The uh, key issue here is the readiness of the force and the medical readiness of the force. And do we have enough doctors, uh, nurses, and medics uh, or corpsmen uh, in the uh, fielded force uh, to handle combat conditions? And are there enough doctors and nurses available uh, to man combat support hospitals and other field hospitals that are necessary in combat? And, and candidly, I do have concerns about that. Um, it's a very challenging subset of our overall military personnel uh, challenges. Uh, but that one in particular uh, causes great attention because in time of war, as we all know, there'll be significant casualties. In peacetime, you're, you're manning these uh, uh, treatment facilities, these hospitals and clinics. Uh, but in wartime, they're going to go forward. Uh, and that is where um, the readiness issues will show up. Right now, we're OK uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but I do have concerns that if we did have a uh, significant conflict uh, in terms of our medical personnel and our ability to deploy. Madam Chair, I have another question, but I'm just about out of time. So I'll, I'll submit that for the record uh, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kirkpatrick. And we're going to be having uh, a military health uh, hearing where we'll get in more depth than that. Uh, Mr. Diaz Ballard has submitted questions for the record. He had to leave. So we're going to turn to Mr. Rogers and then Mr. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> Ms. Bustos. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Secretary, Under Secretary. Oh, it's on. It's on. Can you hear? And General, welcome and thank you for your lifetimes of service to the country. Uh, it's appreciated by millions of Americans. Uh, let me bring up a topic that uh, is, is tough to deal with, and that's escalation or the possibilities of escalation uh, in Ukraine. I know it's our policy uh, to not be directly involved, uh, and uh, you've maintained that distance. However, uh, the, the, the Russians have no compunction about the morals or fair play or rules of war, if you will, and are demonstrating that daily. Um, suppose, for a moment, that the Russians decide to go after the missile sites in Poland uh, or in, in, in the region of any sort. Uh, what do we do? What are the rules of the game that we're into here in this, in this battle? Well, thanks, sir. Uh, and to your point, it's, it's uh, always dangerous uh, to go down the road of hypotheticals, but uh, this is an issue that's very, very important. Uh, if, if Russia decides to attack uh, any nation that's a NATO member, uh, then it's, that's a game changer. Uh, then, you know, by, uh, with respect to the Article 5 commitments, uh, certainly uh, NATO would most likely respond as a, as a coalition in some shape, form, or fashion. And this is a thing that, you know, NATO has, uh, has looked at uh, what it takes to defend NATO countries. It's a thing that's important to us uh, as well. But as you look at Putin's calculus, uh, my view, and I'm sure the chairman has his own view, but my view is that Russia doesn't want to take on uh, the NATO, NATO alliance. Uh, he's got uh, 
you know, a number of uh, troops uh, arrayed in the, in the region right now on the Ukrainian border. Uh, and uh, he had some in, in Belarus and still has some there. Uh, but there are 1.9 million uh, forces in NATO. Uh, NATO has the most, uh, most advanced uh, capabilities of, of uh, any alliance in, in, in the world in terms of aircraft, <laughs> ships, uh, you know, types of uh, uh, weaponry that the, the ground forces use. So this is a fight that he really doesn't want to have. And that would cr very quickly escalate uh, into another type of uh, competition that no one wants to see. General? I, I would just uh, say, Congressman Rogers, that um, we monitor this literally every day. It's one of the most significant things we're doing is monitoring the potential risk of escalation in any domain uh, and uh, by geography, by type weapon, et cetera. And it's something that the secretary has us laser focused on, the president has us laser focused on, and the national security establishment is monitoring it very, very closely. Uh, we can give you uh, more thorough briefings uh, in a classified session. You asked the question about what we would do. Uh, it, it, of course, that's speculative, but uh, there are conditions, there are contingency plans, there are things that we have looked at and will continue to look at, and we monitor it every single day very, very closely. Are we prepared to respond in some fashion? I, I would say that it depends on the, um, you know, the situation, uh, type weapon, uh, nature of escalation, where was it, was it Article 5, was it not? There's a, there's a laundry list of questions and depends on what the answers to those questions are. But in the, the short answer is yes, of course we are. Militarily, we are very, very capable of responding uh, to any form or fashion of escalation if directed by the president. And, and, sir, you've heard the president say that we will defend every inch of NATO. Uh, and you saw that resolve demonstrated uh, shortly after Putin launched his invasion into Ukraine. Uh, we deployed forces to reassure our, our allies in the Baltic states and on the eastern front uh, of, uh, of NATO. Uh, and the president's been very clear about, about his resolve. Uh, throughout this. Uh, he is uh, committed to defending every inch of NATO. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, I'm going to read the next four uh, speakers. However, I will recognize Mr. Cole uh, should he walk in immediately after Ms. Bustos. He is a uh, ranking member on an NIA chairing that's taking place across the hall. With that will be Ms. Bustos. Ms. Captor, Mr. Ryan, and Mr. Kilmer. Ms. Bustos, you're now recognized. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks to our distinguished panel. Uh, appreciate your service to our country. Um, I, the congressional district that I represent is in uh, uh, the entire northwest corner of the state of Illinois, includes the Rock Island Arsenal. And so I'd like to ask a question around that. Um, you know, we talk a lot about ships and planes and space capabilities when we, when we look at our, our national defense. Um, it, but the majority of the sustainment burden um, for a prolonged conflict is uh, going to rest with the Army, specifically the sustainment command. And um, obviously that is part of the arsenal, and that leads to my question. Um, if, you, if you look at history, we know the pivotal role that the, the Army played in our victories in the Pacific during World War II. So wondering about the, the, uh, how we prioritize and account for this in the Army's budget and planning if we assume significantly larger investments in the departments of Air Force and Navy. And maybe uh, uh, we'll, we'll start with you, General Austin, if you could address that, please. Of course, uh, you know, we start with the strategy, uh, as we've said uh, uh, earlier. Uh, and then uh, we make our investments based upon what it takes to support that strategy. And you are correct. Uh, the Army has played a critical role in, uh, in the past. It is playing a critical role as we speak, and it will always play a critical role. Uh, if you look at what, uh, what the Secretary of the Army and the, and the Chief of the Army uh, is, is what they're trying to do in terms of making sure that they can meet their requirements and also modernize the force going forward, uh, you know, they're basing their request uh, for resources on that. And we think, as you've heard me say earlier, I mean, there's, uh, there's $13 uh, uh, billion dollars or so uh, focused on, uh, in, in this budget, focused on making sure that we can maintain a combat-credible uh, land force for both the Army and the Marines. Uh, and, and, and I really like what we see uh, 
both the Army and the Marines doing in terms of their investment in modernization and, and their focus on making sure that they're relevant uh, in any competition, especially uh, uh, any anticipated competition with our in the Indo-Pacific. General Milley, anything to add to that? Uh, the, the Army, um, it, it, relative to the Pacific and relative to some sort of scenario against the People's Republic of China, uh, it is our estimation that the weight of effort would likely be air and sea, maritime and, 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 and air forces. Uh, but having said that, the Marines and the Army will play a very, very critical role in any of those scenarios, as they did, in, as you mentioned, in World War II. Um, even though that was a maritime theater, there was a tremendous amount of idle landings and seizures and so on and so forth. Uh, so it is not a singular service. It is always a joint force uh, executing combined arms operations in all the domains of war to achieve integrated deterrence before war uh, or uh, to uh, achieve uh, victory in the conduct of war. The Army plays a very critical role there. So some of the things the Army is doing uh, in, in this budget and in, 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 in their modernization programs, long-range precision fires, for example, is really critical to any type of conflict in the Pacific. Uh, another one is the uh, transformation of a bunch of uh, their formations into multi-domain uh, task forces, as another example. Uh, they are making some fundamental changes in the uh, development of rotary wing aircraft and future vertical lift. Uh, there's a whole series of modernization initiatives as we move into the future, into the change in the character of war, into the future operating environment that the Army is doing to transform itself so that they can achieve an effect, not only in the Pacific, but anywhere else in the world. The modernization efforts are, are really exciting. I co-chair the uh, the Army Depot and Arsenal Caucus. I, I co-chair that, and uh, we were briefed recently on the modernization efforts, and I'm, I'm going to get into that uh, a little bit as well. So also at the Rock Island Arsenal, we're designated as the Army's Advanced Manufacturing Center of Excellence. We're very proud of that and, you know, obviously supporting the Army's overall goal of, of modernization. So I'd like to get your thoughts on the importance of advanced and additive manufacturing to the Defense Department. Um, it, th that is what is being uh, uh, centralized through the arsenal. Uh, General? Uh, thanks, uh, and thanks for your support throughout. But uh, this is a very important capability. Uh, you know, if you look at additive manufacturing, uh, it, it enables us to produce um, some exquisite types of uh, uh, components, um, and we can do that forward uh, and, uh, and and save time and, and, and stress on our on our logistical chains. Uh, and uh, and so I think it's a great capability. And as this continues to develop, I'm pretty excited about the possibilities. But uh, but I, we know that you know a lot of that is uh, is playing out uh, in your home state, and we we appreciate the support that you provided them. So. Um, uh, 13 seconds left. General Mill, anything to add to that? It's a great capability, and we appreciate what's happening at Rock Island for the entire force. You guys come over and see us, okay? Absolutely. <laughs> You're invited. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cole, unfortunately, will not be joining us, so it'll be Cap, uh, Ms. Captor, Mr. Ryan, Mr. Kilmer, and then Mr. Calvert and I will um, wrap up the hearing. Uh, Ms. Captor. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, <clears throat> Secretary Austin, uh, General Milley, thank you for your exemplary lifetime of service to the people of our country. What a great example each of you are to the young people aspiring uh, in our country. Um, I'm going to make just a couple little short statements, and then I will focus on naval readiness. But um, uh, I come from the four seacoast, and as the Department of Defense uh, considers uh, deploying various assets, and uh, I just ask you to please don't forget the defense industrial base of the country, which Congresswoman Bustos referenced right now, uh, both in terms of um, manufacturing capacity as well as energy. Uh, we are often overlooked as the four sea coast, as we look at um, just the Washington, D.C. area, for example, and uh, uh, so I just wanted to point you to that four sea coast. Uh, secondly, in terms of issues, I'm very concerned about our... Um, uh, military and the nutritional value of food served to our military personnel, having just come back from Grafenwar and Rzeszow uh, in Poland. And I would like you to find someone in the department that could come to my office and we could discuss this. I would be very grateful for that. And then secondly, um, the um, uh, question of uh, uh, Russian vulnerabilities uh, in terms of uh, Ukraine right now. I don't want to talk about it here, but I hope someone somewhere in the defense establishment would be able to brief us on that, uh, as well as the global energy supply issue and how that relates to what is happening on that continent far from here. Uh, thirdly, I just wanted to mention the issue of behavioral health 
And um, I was down at Southcom with some of our members years ago. And shortly thereafter, though, the topic of the meeting was behavioral health. Extremely high-ranking uh, individual took his life in Bahrain, some of them I had met down there. And so um, I can put this on the record as a member of the Mental Health Caucus here in Congress. We, have one, we are 100,000 neuropsychiatrists short as a country. We are 400,000 behavioral nurses short. So how do we attempt to help the people of our country, whether they are principals in schools or uh, commanders of units in the military when we don't have the uh, personnel to do it. I would urge you to consider the Uniformed Services University of Health Services as a portal where we could create a program that would draw people in. They're not going into this field because they earn more operating on people's knees than they do taking care of their neuropsychiatric conditions. But maybe we could have a combined military civilian uh, program <clears throat> that would draw people into this so we could help the people of our country. I just want to put that down. Finally, in terms of naval readiness, I have to say I'm terribly concerned about what happened on the George Washington and on the WASP. I know that um, one of my other subcommittees, we deal with um, nuclear weapons, and the time it's taking both to retool the weapons as well as repair ships is creating a dispirited situation for some of our naval uh, personnel, for example, who thought a ship would be maybe repaired by, if it's sitting in Newport News, you know, a year ago or a year and a half ago. For hundreds of those sailors, they have no access to housing uh, or a car, and they're stuck on the ship. This is really demoralizing. And I am troubled by the defense submission on, on the Navy because I see it getting worse. Uh, and so I just wanted to point a flashlight at this part of the budget and say, we got to do something. And I'm not sure what it is, but we can't keep trying to do everything and not doing it well and not taking care of those who are in service to our country right now and the equipment that we are using and to try to get a faster pace to repair. The George Washington's gonna be up there in uh, uh, dry dock for another year. It was supposed to be finished in 2022. So I'm really worried about this issue and I'm hoping at another briefing or somehow we can get greater clarity on where we're headed on this. So if you have any comments about naval readiness and the uh, backlog of repair, its impact on morale, uh, and where we head, uh, your budget makes me even more nervous. Mr. Secretary, I'll, I'll yield Ms. Captor an additional minute so that you can uh, start answering that question and the rest will take for the record. Mr. Secretary. Okay, well, um, certainly I share your concern uh, on, the, on the issue of mental health and, and, uh, and you know, our uh, access to, uh, uh, to resources. And that's why we're asking you, you for, in this budget, uh, additional resources to, to help us provide greater access to our troops, uh, which includes uh, telehealth care uh, uh, opportunities as well. But this is a, this is a really, really important issue. I, I certainly will take on your, your recommendation to take a look at uh, you know, our uniform services piece here and what can be done there. Uh, and and I, so we'll we'll have somebody come uh, come talk to you on the other issues uh, that you raised as well. And if you want to talk on uh, on global energy supplies, we can, we'll liaise with the uh, with DOE as well to make sure that they're, uh, they know you have an interest here. Um, the repair of a nuclear carrier is, uh, is very, very sophisticated when you, especially uh, that level of repair that it's ongoing. Uh, the pressure that COVID has put on uh, on all of our uh, enterprise uh, is is significant, but you know that that work has continued. Certainly not at the pace that we we'd like to see it continue. Uh, you know that there's uh, there are two investigations ongoing uh, by the Navy on the George Washington issue, uh, and I'm I look forward to seeing the uh, the results of uh, uh, of those investigations, and I'm. I think the Secretary of the Navy is headed down to vi uh, visit with the George Washington uh, chain of command here on the 17th uh, and, uh, and should have uh, greater insights to provide uh, uh, from that visit as well. Uh, there are choices that, that have been made or, or, or will be made in the future in terms of how you billet sailors when, uh, when that repair is ongoing. Whether or not we made the right choices is left to be seen. You know, certainly there's a problem there we got to understand what that problem was a bit better, a bit more, uh, and then uh, we have to figure out uh, what to do to ensure that we don't have these kinds of problems in the future. 
again, I don't think it was anticipated, certainly was, was not anticipated that the ship would be in, in repair, uh, uh, a repair cycle this long, but nonetheless, uh, I expect the leadership to make the right decisions, and I look forward to, to seeing what the investigations are going to show us here. So. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Ryan and Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me uh, extend my uh, thanks as well. I can't imagine how many sleepless nights you've had over the past few months, and we appreciate it. You're the defenders of freedom in this country, and, and we're here to try to help and support uh, the best we can. I'm going to kind of go through a few things, uh, comments before I have my question. First, let me just say my own personal opinion. We know this ultimately is going to be the decision of Ukraine and their leadership. But I don't think that the Russians should be allowed to have an inch of territory in that country. I just don't think we can reward this kind of behavior. And I know it's clearly more complicated than that, but I think it's important that you, you know where we stand. Um, to get to some of the issues Ms. Kapter brought up around the mental health. Um, having worked on these issues for a long time, and, and Mr. Secretary, you mentioned the suicide issue, which is pervasive across our society now. One of the recommendations I would give is, and we've been trying to work on this, how do you evaluate people who are coming into the military? One of the more recent uh, analyses of this issue is around adverse childhood experiences, where people coming into the military are bringing trauma uh, from their childhood could be multiple adverse childhood experiences, but in each one of these experiences, it increases uh, your rates of depression, increases your rates of mental health issues, increases your rates of suicide. So I think if you're going to go at this thing, really trying to get some get some knowledge about the person before they even step foot in the military, and that'll help. I think uh, begin to try to address uh, some of those issues. Um, I also want to mention. Uh, having more of a whole of government approach. Um, you, you look at the problems that we have now in, in Eastern Europe, a lot of this uh, is, is because of the energy issue and the over-reliance on, on Russia uh, for oil and gas. And I think a, a whole of government approach, we have gas in Eastern Ohio, Western PA, uh, Utica Shale, Marcella Shale. How do we build the infrastructure to get this gas liquid natural gas or whatever it is, out of eastern Ohio to eastern Europe. And, and having a, 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 you know, obviously not necessarily a short-term uh, solution, but a mid to long-term solution to help our, help our allies uh, in Europe be more reliant on American energy than on, on Vladimir Putin, which could, uh, I think, you know, knock the legs out from under him. Um, lastly, and Ms. Kaptur brought this up too, and she mentioned it around the issue of food. And, you know, it may seem like an ancillary issue in the military, but we've seen from recent studies, multiple studies uh, showing increased rates of obesity, increased rates of diabetes in the military. Now, a few years ago, I sat on the, the VA committee, right? So we're seeing, like, what are we feeding our troops when they're active? And now we have obesity and diabetes when they go to the VA, which is driving up costs. And I've been working on this issue for a couple years, and we've had the Army make promises about the, a campus dining pilot, the Air Force Academy, which in good faith they got shut down because of the pandemic, um, but the superintendent there promised to resume the program. Air Force promised to expand their food 2.0 modernization to food 3.0. None of these services mentioned fulfilled their assurances. Um, Navy and Marine Corps did not break any promises because they haven't made any promises. Um, but to me, uh, the, when you see the recently published report on the military food system, the GEO found that the, each service is abysmal managed, uh, abysmally managed its food systems. And I just think this is, this is something that it's so complicated. My staff brought me a flow chart of how, how the food system works in the military. It's insane. I mean, there's so many, it's dry, you know, there's no, there's no flow. Um, and I just want to be very clear. This is not a food. Um, this is a food management and operations problem. This isn't a nutrition problem. Everybody knows what we should be eating. I mean, it's, it's a pretty common knowledge. Um, so in, in 22, Mr. Secretary, we passed legislation recommending the formation of a food transformation cell which in, within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And if you could just tell us, you know, what the status is of that cell 
and and how you can assure us that as we move towards food transformation, there's not going to be more broken promises. I think this is a very important issue for us to save money that we can then put into, you know, a lot of these other programs. Mr. Secretary, once again, I'll give you a few extra uh, moments here to answer the question. I thank the chair for her generosity. <laughs> well, thanks, sir. First of all, let me thank you for your interest in this and the work that you've done in, uh, in the past. And I would, uh, I would like to say that I share your concerns on, uh, on the importance of this. And I think that the food transformation cell will, will provide uh, significant uh, a benefit in terms of assisting us in coordinating our efforts here. Um, that cell is going to be stood up in September. And uh, then in October, uh, we'll submit a report to you on, on how we stood it up and, and, and the progress that's been made to date. So we're... It, it's it's a work in progress, but uh, September is the date when that cell will, will start. Okay. Well, we, thank you, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you both for being with us um, and, and for your service to our country. Uh, last year when you were in front of the subcommittee, I asked about the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Program, the SIOP, uh, which is a 20-year, $20 $21 billion investment in modernizing and optimizing our shipyards. Um, I was pleased to hear both of you say very positive things about that, about the importance of that in terms of the capacity of the Navy to, to meet its mission um, and just understanding how critical uh, that was. And I want to I thank you for that, not only for your support of SIOP, but for our public shipyards too. Um, having said that, I, I am a bit worried that the program's falling behind in terms of both cost and, and time. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but... This really matters. We don't have a shipyard on the West Coast that can handle a Ford-class carrier. And so time is of the essence and would gleefully invite you to come, come visit Puget Sound Able Shipyard in, in our neck of the woods. Um, the SIOP relies on area development plans to inform the optimization program uh, portions of the SIOP and provide accurate schedule and cost estimates. Um, those were originally scheduled to be completed at the end of this fiscal year. It looks like that's probably going to slip to the end of um, next fiscal year. The, or even later, uh, the Navy almost also promised to provide a PSYOP strategic framework to coincide with the release of the president's budget, but Congress still hasn't received that plan. That guidance aligns all the PSYOP act activities and provides the overarching framework to implement the PSYOP as it moves from the planning into the ex execution phase. So I, I'm just concerned that delays both to the area development plans and to the PSYOP strategic framework could postpone implementation of some investments that really need to happen for the Navy to meet its mission. Um, so I, I guess I want to hear from you sort of what the plan is for just making sure that this program stays on track uh, and, and what your office is planning in that regard. Uh, thanks, sir. Th again, thanks for your support and your focus on, on this. Um, it, it is truly important in, in terms of making sure that we maintain a world-class capability that we've had and will continue to have with our United States Navy. Um, we invested uh, in this last year. Uh, we're asking you for $1.7 billion uh, to, uh, uh, to put towards this work uh, going forward. It's, that's an historic amount. It's twice the amount that we invested in last year. Um, it certainly helps to get a budget passed on time uh, so that uh, we can make sure that, uh, that we're uh, you know, implementing our plans uh, on uh, on time, uh, and uh, and and clearly, uh, I believe that going forward, without the impacts of COVID and some other things, that we'll be able to come closer to uh, to meeting our, our goals and objectives. Uh, but uh, but again, we're not where we want to be. Uh, this is important to the Navy, and uh, and again, we'll make sure that the Navy is doing everything it can uh, to maintain pace, and we're going to have to pick up the pace here. So. Do you envision a future in which we have to, or you have to set specific targets and metrics and timelines and milestones to just ensure that the Navy's keep it on track? Uh, Navy has those, uh, but but certainly uh, making sure that they that they execute uh, in accordance with the plan is uh, is important. And if and if those uh, those goals and objectives are are insufficient, then you know we'll revisit that. So. Let me ask with the time I have left. Um, I know unmanned vehicles are a key part of the cutting edge technologies uh, that DOD is using now and in the future to combat threats from Russia and China and elsewhere. 
Um, the Navy's 30-year shipbuilding plan calls for an increase in unmanned assets. The plan proposed to grow the fleet of unmanned subsurface vehicles from zero in the current inventory to potentially 50 by fiscal year 2045. Um, growth in these technologies will lean on installations, including Keyport in my neck of the woods, uh, which is one of the leaders in UUVs, uh, un unmanned underwater vehicles. As the Navy begins to acquire more unmanned vehicles, how can Congress ensure the Navy is ready to operate this technology alongside manned vehicles? Well, I, you know, we're still learning a lot. Uh, I, I point to some of the work that, uh, that the Fifth Fleet Commander is doing out, out in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it, this is tremendous capability that we've just begun to scratch the surface on. Uh, in, in, in terms of what it's going to take to fully develop this, uh, there are a bunch of unknowns now. But it's, you know, I, I believe that this is, uh, this is a capability that we need to go after uh, faster, further. And, and, and so I'll work with the CNO and the SECMAV uh, to ensure that, you know, they've, they're identifying what their needs are going forward and, and, and that this capability is fully integrated into you know, our manned uh, surface uh, and, and, and underwater uh, capabilities as well. So. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You'll bet. Mr. Calvert, any uh, closing uh, remarks? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm going to uh, submit a number of uh, questions uh, for the record and uh, regarding innovation, hypersonics, Taiwan, fuel costs, a whole bunch of things that uh, we don't have time to cover today. But uh, General Milley, I'm I, we had discussed this the other day, and I, uh, <coughs> after our hasty exit from Afghanistan, I'm concerned about taking our eye off uh, that region. Obviously, it's still a problem. And as you know, three of the 13 service members killed in Afghanistan were either in or near my district in California, Lance Corporal Kareem Nakui, Corporal Hunter Lopez, and Lance Corporal Dylan Marola. Uh, the families of the fallen of these uh, well, these folks, uh, these, these heroes, uh, want obviously justice and accountability. Uh, we can discuss this more in a classified setting, uh, but as you know, we're doing uh, what you're doing to to find uh, and prosecute these terrorists uh, to conducted that suicide attack at Gabby Gate is is, an, is extremely important. Not just not just to the families, but to the morale of the United States Marine Corps that uh, obviously went there and did their duty. Um, also, I'm concerned about the limitations presented over the horizon counterterrorism capability that uh, potentially will allow ISIS-K and Al-Qaeda to regroup. I don't think we should take our eye off the ball on that. And uh, as much as you can say in this setting to uh, ensure that Afghan never becomes a haven for terrorists, again, I look to hear that. And uh, what kind of capability have we lost uh, to conduct counterterrorism missions in the future? Well, first, uh, Congressman, let me say how you know, deeply I feel personally, and, and I know the Secretary does as well, and all of the senior leaders uh, in uniform feel about the loss of any of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and particularly those 13 that were uh, killed at Abbey Gate. Um, uh, we feel that personally, uh, and none more personally than the families of the fallen. Uh, so we owe them uh, not only a great deal of gratitude, but we owe them accountability for those that killed their loved one. We know that, uh, and we have not forgotten, uh, and we will not forget, uh, not until justice is served. Um, with respect to over the rising capability, I'd, I'd like to go into some detail in a classified session, but uh, you and the American people should know that we remain committed uh, as a military uh, to the very first mission statement that we got in Afghanistan, which was to ensure that Afghanistan never again becomes a platform. Uh, from which terrorists will strike the continental United States. Uh, they haven't done that uh, since 911, uh, and we are committed to making sure that never happens again. Uh, we do maintain surveillance, and I won't go into the details of how or what forms or mechanisms, uh, and we do have the capabilities to conduct strike operations if we see a threat emanating from the land of Afghanistan. Uh, but I'd prefer to take the rest of it into a classified session. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I think you heard quite a bit from this committee the concerns about um, the Navy and shipbuilding and the number of ships. And we're going to have the Secretary of Navy in front of us, so I'm sure he's got a preview of what's what uh, will be coming uh, their way. Um, one, one point that I uh, spoke with uh, 
with uh, you, Secretary Austin, when we met uh, over uh, a couple of months ago in the Senate, and you, um, General Milley, is uh, the role of any, if possible, to repurpose, maybe even work with the Coast Guard with any of the um, littoral combat ships in the Atlantic. China is also making inroads and wanting to be in the Atlantic, and there might be a mission that they can be refitted for, repurposed for, not all of them, but uh, working together with you. And I know that that's going to be pencil to paper to figure out if, that, if that's smart and if that works in working with AFRICOM and with um, the Baton Commander in Latin America. But there's a simple fact here. The United States does not have the ship be, uh, shipbuilding industrial base to manufacture, let alone maintain uh, a Navy that can completely numerically compete with China. But quantity alone is not the point. It's quality and capability that matter, as you gentlemen pointed out. China might have 500 ships, but half of those ships are small support vessels that have no qualitative edge over a U.S. combat ship. The debate, I believe, needs to be very substantiated uh, and not uh, just picking a number that we think might be for the right uh, uh, number of ships for the U.S. to have. Um, that's why the concept of an integrated deterrence is so important, and the, the new national defense strategy talks quite a bit about this. The idea that it's necessary to confront China as a united front with our Pacific allies, that we do not do it alone. We have the support of the Japanese, the South Koreans, and the Australians. And only by leveraging our collective strength as democracies, as n d democratic nations, as we have done with NATO and as we are doing right now uh, in the battle for Ukraine to uh, be a free and sovereign nation, we need to bring all our assets together. So for the record, uh, China, as, as I said, has about 500 ships, 230 are smaller support vessels. The United States has 290 combat vessels. Japan has smaller support vessels, but they have 154. South Korea has 160 ships. Some are small support vessels, and Australia has 43. So um, as we talk about how to right-size the number of ships we have, but also repair the ships that need to come in, we're going to have some real in-depth discussions with the Secretary of Navy about what's happening in our shipyards. Uh, another uh, item that uh, this committee needs to work on, and, and, and shipbuilding uh, involves the, the public-private partnerships that we have. It also involves MILCON, and it also involves the authorizers. Can, uh, Mr. Calvert and I just don't do this alone. We're going to have to have robust discussions. Why not? An <laughs> another, another place where robust discussions have to take place, because at the end of the day, we're the bill payer. Uh, needs to be on base realignment. Once again, that's going to be the authorizers. It needs to be MILCON and our committee. And these are uncomfortable discussions to have. I realize it. But BRAC, uh, which is under the preview of the authorizers uh, and the military uh, construction subcommittee, have to start working with us to address these issues. I want to fully state my support for a new round of BRAC. The department has stated in recent years that it has nearly 20 percent excess infrastructure, and we pay for that infrastructure to be maintained, and it's doing nothing. Many of our installations were aligned and built in the wake of World War II, and as we have clearly discussed today, the world has changed. A new round of BRAC is necessary, and I believe it could save taxpayers billions of dollars, and it could also save the department a lot of time and energy expended to maintaining something that is not useful to the department anymore. I'm now asking you to comment on these issues. We will be submitting questions for the record and questions for the secretary. So I want to thank you both for coming. I want to thank you for answering our questions live today and taking all the questions that are coming your way in written form. And I also want to give a special thank you with, and I think you'll agree with me, to Mr. McCord. You are, you are on call. You are in my office frequently. You take, you take questions that this committee staff works on as we prepare the budget and uh, so that we have the best bill possible to uh, make sure that our national defense needs are met. So thank you again. Uh, thank you for all those who serve under you, with you, and your families. 
And this will conclude today's hearing. And the committee, the subcommittee, stands adjourned. <laughs>